You'll remember this is a photograph from a 1949 issue of Life magazine showing Pablo Picasso drawing an incredible and spontaneous image of a centaur using an early ver version of the electric light pen. This image is an artist's rendering of the electromagnetic field, or torus, that's the geometric term, which emanates from the human heart and completely surrounds the human body. Now, we've known for over 150 years that electrical impulses passing through a conductive medium generate an electromagnetic field. And evidently, the heart is now known to be a significant conductive medium. So now that we know that this remarkable EM field is generated from our heart and actually exists outside our physical body, I have a question. <clears throat> if not just an interesting coincidence, does Picasso's centaur have some relationship with the heart's EM field and hence with the heart itself? Now, as I studied for this presentation, I learned that an understanding of the heart's EM field actually begins with the brain and how the anatomy of the brain leads us to the question that we've just asked. Now, this will be a very brief and simplified trip to an infinitely more complex subject, but it's important to begin our inquiry with the basic anatomy of the brain. The main components of the brain provide a very strong illustration of human evolution. These components can be understood as our basic neural building blocks, sequentially and historically layered one on top of the other. The first and most ancient level of our brain is generally called the reptilian complex or reptilian brain. This level contains most of the simple neural structures that are present in reptiles and is the basic engine for our involuntary biological activities such as our heartbeat, breathing, and body temperature. Apart from regulating these essential biofunctions, the reptilian brain is also the repository of our most primal instincts for survival and reproduction. One article that I reviewed recently described the not very complex involuntary calculus of the reptilian brain. A reptile's relationships are simple. When its primitive vision spots a moving clump of contrasting light and dark, which is the only visual discernment this uh, that uh, a reptile can make, the reptile asks, is this clump something to eat, to be eaten by, or something to mate with? This is the part of our brain where the term fight or flight finds its origin. Now, the second and next most ancient level of our brain is generally called the old mammalian or limbic brain. This level of our brain has most of the basic neural structures found in smaller mammals. It contains our ability to record and process experiences in a more sophisticated, is it good or is it bad kind of response. The limbic response is the foundation of our cognitive and emotional engagement with the world and is actually the main battleground where our emotions and emotional memories influence our cognitive decisions. We see this primary uh, emotional cognitive process in many lesser mammals, often acted out as a very reactive emotion-driven emotion behavior. These abrupt emotional reflexes are still a significant feature of our own human behavior as well. I know that for a fact. We could call the limbic brain a slightly more sophisticated engine for the fight, flight, or mate response because of its ability to process experiences, remember them, and most importantly, to introduce the element of unpredictability in our behavior. In this experiment, a single heart cell was extracted from a live mouse, then placed in vitro, and was then observed under a microscope. At first, the single heart cell pulsated evenly for a while, but then began to experience arrhythmia, which quickly led to a fatal fibrillation spasm, after which the, the, the cell soon died. Basically, a microheart attack. As a follow-up experiment, the researchers placed a pair of individual heart cells in vitro and observed exactly the same pattern. First, an even rhythm, then arrhythmia, and finally, fibrillation. Now, during the fibrillation phase, the researchers began moving the two heart cells together, closer to one another, and at a certain critical proximity, the cells stopped fibrillating. Then within, within this critical range, they synchronized into a normal pulse rhythm with one another, without actually touching one another. 
Now, the researchers had essentially created a functional two-cell microscopic heart, where the cells were not hard connected by tissue, but were in a direct EM relationship with one another. What these researchers discovered was the foundation of the now widely used cardiac therapy called entrainment, which is the technical foundation of modern cardiac pacemakers and defibrillators. Now, here's another interesting and related entrainment story. Anyone that's observed a new mother nursing her baby can relate to the deep emotional bond that exists between mother and child. But did you know that the cardiac rhythms and EM frequencies of a nursing mother and her baby are often virtually synchronous? Their heartbeats within milliseconds of one another. Even more remarkable, is that this synchronous heart relationship is not even dependent on physical contact. Often, a mother need only look at her baby affectionately for their heartbeats, or their heartbeats to entrain and synchronize. Now, this is obviously not just the laboratory report of two mouse heart cells connected in a Petri dish. This is actually us. Now, we've had a very brief exposure to the unique anatomy of our evolutionary brain and the powerful EM relationship that's inherent in our biological heart. Now, even though some of the information was perhaps a bit dry, sorry about that, it was important that I introduce you to the key concepts that have inspired the emerging science of neurocardiology. In the remaining time that I have, I'm going to offer you some possible reasons why this new science might be really important in your search for truth, whatever that may represent to you. And if by chance these possibilities do become important in your search for truth, it will be because you are inspired to rethink your own concept of thinking. What is neurocardiology exactly? Well, the simplest way to explain neurocardiology is to say that it's a clinical science that's new, barely 10 years old, and is primarily about unpacking and understanding the complicated relationship between our brain, our nervous system, and of course, our heart traditional cardiology has understood and treated the human heart as a pump, a biomechanically sophisticated pump, a very essential and impressive pump, but nevertheless a pump. The development of artificial implants and valves and even heart transplant practices have mostly grown out of this paradigm that the heart was essentially a pumping station for the body. However, as the pace of research intensified in the separate field of neuroscience, a more detailed mapping of the brain-body network established that neuroscience and cardiology could no longer be separate. Neurocardiologists have determined that up to 60% of the estimated 6 billion cells that make up our heart muscle are not actually muscle cells, but are in fact neural cells or neurons. These heart neurons are identical to the neurons that make up the human brain. Now, why is this discovery of so many neural cells in our heart so important? That question leads us right back to the brain. Our brain is 100% comprised of neurons. These neurons are organized into fields or clusters called ganglia. Now, on the screen are the images of a ganglia cluster involving three single neurons named Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. Okay, you probably have guessed these are not their scientific names. Uh, neural ganglia are connected internally and externally by so-called hard electrical connectors called axons, which are the long single strands, and dendrites, which are the tree branch offshoots from the neurons. You don't see those, I hope. And are also connected by so-called soft EM field connectors called glia, which are the smaller red and blue star cluster thingies that are kind of hanging around the axons. Can everyone see that? These complex neural fields interconnect with billions of other neural fields throughout the brain. Inside our brain alone, it's estimated that there are some 100 billion single neurons with some 100 trillion hard and soft interconnections. It's these billions upon billions of EM-driven interconnected neural fields that are the foundation of the mystery and the wonder that is our thoughts, our imagination, our awareness, our physical existence, our consciousness of who we are and who we could become. Now, in a similar fashion, our heart's 3.6 billion neural cells, by the way, that's the second largest reservoir of neurons in our body, are also organized into ganglia. And 
They interconnect with many other essential neural fields throughout the body, as well as with neural fields in all three levels of the brain. Many of these essential neural connections are the well-documented paths for regulating our bodily functions and our adaptive responses to all the physical variations of living. However, as neurocardiology research continues, there is increasing evidence that our heart's extensive neural network is designed for much more than just ensuring blood and oxygen is efficiently circulated in our body. Not that I'm knocking blood and oxygen, but many neuroscientists are now asking, what could that much more possibly be? The science of neurocardiology has inspired a new understanding of the human heart as part of a deeper and potentially game-changing new paradigm. So what do we now understand about the heart? Well, we now understand that the heart is much more than just an excellent biomechanical pump. We now understand that the heart is largely comprised of the same cellular material as the human brain. We now understand that in addition to the important role of the heart in our body's functional existence, there is a whole new set of mysteries about the role of the heart in our neural existence. Now, here's one of those new mysteries. Did you know that the maximum voltage generated by the heart's neural activity is 40 to 60 times greater than the voltage generated by the brain's neural activity? Even a single heartbeat generates enough energy to illuminate a small electric light bulb, a single heartbeat. The powerful energy signature of the human heart does explain the existence of this large EM field outside of our body. And yet, while we can now understand the existence of the EM field, we don't understand the reason for its existence, not yet. But as a starting point in the search for that reason, you might be asking yourself if neurocardiology has just presented us with some early evidence of a unique new neural platform that functions both inside and outside of the body. Now, if you're already past that starting point, let me share with you three tiny, uh, what I'm going to call thought candles, that might illuminate your first steps on this journey. Oh, and the candles are actually questions as well. The first thought candle is provided uh, by an American scientist by the name of David Bohm, who is considered one of the most important voices in modern theoretical physics and quantum mechanics. Dr. Bohm developed a revolutionary theory of human cognition that sought to answer a difficult question. How does simple electromagnetic energy, when combined with our neural cells, transform into human consciousness itself? Dr. Bohm proposed that what we know to be consciousness might physically exist at the quantum or subatomic level of our combined neural field. I mean, why not? It's this very understanding of the difference between classical physics and quantum physics that's helped us to move from the vacuum tube to the microprocessor, or from copper wire to fiber optics. His theory was a quantum physics vision of our unparalleled ability to process and store a vast, finite, conscious world, as well as create an infinite, imagined world. Dr. Bohm theorized that at the quantum level, our thoughts could actually have substance and mass, like an electron or a neutrino. Now, on the subject of neutrinos, as we've recently learned through our own Canadian Nobel physicist, Dr. Arthur MacDonald, neutrinos originating from just, just the sun's EM field alone pass through our bodies at the rate of 100 trillion per second. It's a mind-boggling number. And now we know that neutrinos have mass. They actually exist. So as Dr. Bohm has suggested, is it possible that our own consciousness is a real physical entity in the unseen quantum world? The second thought candle is an intellectual event that may be related to the quantum view of our EM brain and heart. This is an image of the benzene ring one of the most important scientific discoveries of the past two centuries. It's important because it's the foundation of organic chemistry, which is only the science that pretty much underpins all organic life and a huge portion of our material life. All of our pharmaceuticals and compounds and plastics are all based on organic chemistry formulas. In 1865, scientists were struggling with the mystery of chemical structure 
Many researchers in many countries had been seeking the answer to this mystery, but it was a German chemist named Auguste Cocule who first articulated the correct structure of the benzene molecule, which became the template for the entire field of modern organic chemistry. After years of studying and writing about the problem of chemical structure, he finally published his own theory of the benzene ring in 1865, and as they say, the rest is history. The most interesting feature of this theory is the way in which Dr. Kekul arrived at his groundbreaking conclusion. It wasn't until 1890, 25 years after he started the revolution, that Dr. Kekul shared his story at a scientific conference. He said that after a particularly frustrating and tiring day, his exhausted mind lapsed into a kind of half-awake daydream state. As he nodded off, he had a brief but very clear vision of a group of dancing atoms that gradually formed into the image of a serpent seizing its own tail. And in that moment, he awoke with a new and correct vision of the circular atomic structure of the benzene molecule. Now, how did this important vision enter into his consciousness? And if the image of this serpent or the idea of the benzene ring pre-existed in the quantum realm of consciousness, where did it come from? The final thought candle, which might illuminate our questions about the Picasso brain-heart connection, doesn't originate from a very intellectual source. In fact, it comes from the world of mental disabilities and the phenomenon known as savant syndrome. Savants are a remarkable, remarkable mystery. Uh, in the world of neuroscience. They are generally autistic. They usually have an IQ rating that does not exceed 25. By the way, a normal IQ is approximately 100, and a genius IQ is about 140. They often have limited ability to read or write, and many savants are institutionalized because of their inability to properly socialize with other people. On a classic or non-quantum level, the neural life of a savant is functionally inferior. You can probably tell where this is going. And yet, savants are being rigorously studied because of their special, even superhuman abilities that just seem to emerge from some unknown dimension of their functionally inferior neural life. Well, let me share a couple of brief but extremely powerful examples of this phenomenon. This is a photograph of Leslie Lemke. He was born in 1952, a victim of multiple severe birth defects that included eye disease, cerebral palsy, and extensive infant brain damage. His retinal damage was so severe that it necessitated the removal of his eyes shortly after birth. And his prognosis was so grim that his despairing birth mother gave him up for adoption. At six months, he was adopted by a compassionate nurse by the name of May Lemke. But for the first seven years of his life, Leslie barely moved and uttered no sounds at all. He was unable to stand until age 12 and unable to walk until age 15. But at age 16, May Lemke was awakened in the middle of the night to the sounds of their old piano being played. She discovered Leslie at the piano, playing a near-perfect version of Tchaikovsky's Piano Concerto No. 1. He had heard the musical piece, he had heard it, but he had heard it just once as a soundtrack to a TV movie that he could not see. Now, he had likely pounded some piano keys before as kind of a therapy tool, but he had very limited exposure to anyone actually playing the piano, and certainly never for a musical piece so complicated. Leslie was able to duplicate this incredible transference many times with different musical compositions in various public settings. His ability to totally assimilate a complex musical piece from a single listening is only overshadowed by his instant ability to actually perform that piece on an instrument that he never learned to play. How did he acquire this unique ability without instruction or practice? This is a photograph of Ellen Boudreaux. <clears throat> she was born in 1957, blind and autistic, and was unable to walk until age four. Very soon after Ellen be began to walk and assisted, her parents noticed that she possessed an extraordinary spatial awareness 
for obstacles that went beyond the expected enhanced spatial awareness that normally accompanies blindness. As her spatial sense developed, Ellen was able to pinpoint the exact location of objects such as fences and walls up to a distance of six feet. Her father noticed that she was able to walk through thick forests without ever running into a single tree. Is it possible that severe autism somehow triggered Ellen's EM field to interpret spatial information so accurately? Ellen's spatial radar was not her most amazing ability. And in spite of uh, the photograph, it was not her extraordinary musical gift, which she also had, by the way. It was this. As a small child, Ellen had an irrational fear of the telephone. Uh, by the time she was eight years old, her mother decided to experiment with ways to help Ellen uh, overcome this fear. So one day, she dialed up the telephone time lady. Now, some of you may remember, some of you know, the people that are older here may remember this early kind of robo service of the telephone company. The time lady was a pleasant, pre-recorded female voice that gently reported the passage of time, both by minute and seconds. Okay. We used to phone it up and set our watches by the telephone time lady. Now, Ellen listened to the time lady for only about 10 minutes before she returned to her room, mimicking the voice that she'd just heard. Some moments later, when Ellen spoke the imitated time declaration, the time is now 1.59 and 59 seconds. Her next words were, the time is now 2 o'clock. Coincidentally, it was exactly 2 o'clock. Now, before you conclude that this moment was perhaps not so amazing, you should know that in the 10 minutes that Ellen was listening to the time lady, no change of the hour took place. Obviously, Ellen had never seen a clock. No one had ever explained the concept of the mathematics of time passage to this autistic 8-year-old. And not finished. From that moment in 1960 to this very day, because Ellen's now 63, she is still able to tell you the exact time of day to the minute and second without ever seeing a clock. Now, what enabled a blind autistic Ellen to first absorb the dynamics of time and then to know her exact place in time for over 50 consecutive years? I'm hoping that this brief talk will move you to reconsider the possible relationship between Picasso, centaur, and space, his EM brain, and his EM heart. And whether you're considering Picasso, centaur, or uh, Dr. Kekul's benzene molecule, or Leslie Lemke's sudden ability to perform Tchaikovsky, or Ellen Boudreaux's perfect inner clock, or even your own personal stories of unexpected or unexplained inspiration, I'm hoping that you'll be moved to ask more questions, such as, is Dr. Bohm's theory about the quantum existence of consciousness a possible new lens through which we can examine these stories? Do our thoughts have a quantum-based identity that not only enables them to occupy space in our consciousness, but also enables them to pass through space like so many neutrinos? Is there a reason to think that the inherent talents and abilities that we euphemistically call gifts are in fact actual gifts that are somehow transferred or transplanted into our neural field? Could this unseen transfer of gifts be one way of explaining the reason for our neural heart to operate so powerfully outside of our body? Okay, I know I've asked a lot of questions tonight. Uh, and I know it's sometimes easier to just default back to our reasonable and safe evidence-based skepticism. Uh, it would be a completely reasonable response to, uh, to what basically amounts to a bunch of interesting anecdotes right, that may or may not be connected. You may remember from our first gathering that I said we are not about connecting the dots, but only about sharing the dots with you. But even if your reasonable, evidence-based approach to life doesn't want to tackle the myriad of questions that I've just asked, how about just one question? If the evidence indicates that this unique heart-generated EM field actually exists, why? 